thank you everyone for coming tonight and thank you so much to Father Teodosi and to Patty Schneier for coming and being with us this evening. It's been a real privilege to be involved in this marriage summit which is now at the very end and um, it's been a it's been a huge blessing to hear from a lot of speakers a lot of priests and to just keep enriching our knowledge um, our experience our you know hearing stories from people and examples it's been a huge blessing this morning we heard from dr matthew sakonikas and he unpacked in such a beautiful way uh, God's vision for marriage and the links between marriage and communion and he was just a stirring up I, I, it's such a beautiful vision you have to listen to it if you haven't had a chance so all of these talks will be all of the recordings will be sent to anyone who's registered plus they will be easy to be found on our, our YouTube channel so yeah, right now they're 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 not disclosed but as soon as we've got them edited the way we want we'll make them public so anybody can watch them i think most of them we have edited but yeah there's yeah, yeah. we have a little bit of work to do so uh with that i think we will have oh, maybe just a couple other little kind of housekeeping things since this is the last session um just watch your emails those of you who are here and we will as you know we've been sending out some emails so maybe too many but um and because we're really thankful, we've been getting some feedback on the little survey that we sent out, which is helpful. So if you've done that, thank you. And um, and and we're also going to be starting up a kind of a Tuesday night, kind of, in a way, a continuation of this. It'll be shorter sessions, but we're looking forward to that. We just want it, We kind of want to keep it going because we think that uh, there's a there's a need, there's a hunger for all of us to continue to grow in our marriages, to continue to grow closer to our spouses, and of course to God, who helps us then grow closer to our spouses too. So we're going to keep it going on Tuesday evenings. So uh, I think that's about it for now. So if, Paul, if you want to take it away. All right. So Father Teodosi Krejcik, I got to know him when he was serving at uh, St. Basil's Ukrainian Catholic Church in Edmonton, because I was the Lutheran pastor down the street journeying towards Catholicism and I would come down to to that parish to St. Basil's and Father Krejcik would allow me to pray in the beautiful little chapel they have there and some of you may have seen his conversion story on uh, EWTN on uh, a journey home so if you go to you know journey home look in their archi archives I'm sure you can find you know the record of father's talk on his conversion story. It's a wonderful story. It's very inspiring. Yeah. And so Father Teodosi is a revert back to the Catholic faith. And he's now a priest monk. How do you pronounce it? Hero monk? Hiero monk? Hiero monk. Hiero monk. Hiero monk. Yeah. And he's working to live the traditional Eastern Christian monastic life in the Ukrainian Greco Catholic in Canada. Uh, and he's presently living at Madonna House and uh, serving there. So, Father, would you please pray for us and then share your meditation with us? Sure. So we'll, we'll uh, just say a little prayer that we always use in the Eastern tradition, Eastern Byzantine tradition, calling upon the Holy Spirit to um, bless our, our comings and goings and especially to orient our, our lives towards him and invoke his grace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. In the name of the Father and the Son, amen. O heavenly King, advocate spirit true, you are everywhere present and flow often. Treasury of blessings bestow on the river. Come and dwell within us, cleanse us of all that defiles us, and your oh, good ones save our soul. Christ our God sent the grace of the Holy Spirit upon us this evening. We gather here online for those who have given us thoughts and courage. Bless us, sanctify us. Fill us with wisdom, fill us with wisdom and light, 
que a gente vai ser muito difícil de perceber. Então, o que é exato que a gente vai fazer? O Deus que deseja nos deixar a sua criação e nos dar glória a Deus. Amen. Say, Amen. Father, we have a little bit of, you're cutting out a bit. So I'm okay. wondering which mic, do you have a mic around you or is it in front of you? It's on the computer. It's on the computer. Okay, when you're closer, yeah. it seems a bit better. So let's just so see. It, it was just need cutting. To stay close and speak loudly. Okay. Okay. Very yes. good. That sounds very good. good. Thank you so much for that prayer. That's good. 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 Um, so yes, my name is Father uh, Theodosi. I'm a high row monk, which means a priest monk in the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. So we call it Greek Catholic because we follow the the Byzantine tradition, and um, our tradition has a a very kind of particular perspective on the mystery of salvation. And the mystery of Christ's work to redeem us, and to save us, especially caught up in the idea of divinization, of salvation encapsulated in that, in that work of God to unite his creation to himself, so that what is what he is by nature, he may become by grace. The Roman Church, we would call that the work of sanctification and a process of our coming into union with the Lord. We call it the process of theosis or divinization. The goal of salvation is that we become like God as we were created to be in the beginning, getting his image and likeness, and we sin the fall, we lose that image and likeness. But all of God's work is to restore that. And uh, not just to restore it at a superficial level, but to make us one with him. As Augustine said, oh, happy fault that won us so great a savior. Because the savior is, does precisely that. He, he fills us with grace that we become like God. And it's it's from that kind of angle I wanna I wanna approach the whole question of marriage that you've been reflecting on this past week um, from that kind of uh, high perspective um, to look at in a sense the prophetic essence of marriage. You just reflect on that at the beginning of this talk that you're going to be having, especially as regards worship as couples and prayer as couples towards the Lord. But um, maybe a good idea to to look at it from that high ground. Um, Proverbs, the beautiful line in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, for lack of vision, my people perish. And we are a perishing people in our age. Uh, the stats about um, the falling apart of marriage in our societies all over the Western world, is, it's amazing. Uh, we had some statistics recently from Czechoslovakia that had been shared in, in our church. This is from 2015. It's very interesting. For those who entered into a civil marriage, one in two divorce. For those who entered in a church marriage, but without practicing religiously, one in three divorce. For those who enter in a church marriage and attend every Sunday, one in 50 divorce. And wow. for those who have a church marriage and attend divine liturgy, the Sunday liturgy, and pray daily at home, one in 1,429 divorce. So there's your stats. Mm -hmm. that, that says everything, really. I mean, that's just for Czechoslovakia, or Czech, I should say. No. But uh, I'm sure that that's right across the board. The family that prays together stays together, and the marriage that prays together stays together. But to have the vision, the vision of what this is all about. I mean, you've been talking, I'm sure, about beautiful uh, insights into marriage, and especially the mechanics of, of couples uh, of working things out together and, and coming into deeper communion with each other and 
all the, the uniqueness of, of a man and a woman and the gift of self to one another. But I'd like to just to call you to uh, reflect on a, a high vision of what the ultimate, the ultimate a prophetic essence of marriage in the church is all about. What is it meant to reflect? What is it meant to, to be a sign of in the world? We say that marriage is a sacrament. And sacraments are signs that effectively signify uh, what, what they are, what they're, what, a sign that effectively signifies itself. And marriage is a sign, ultimately, of the very divine plan that God has for his creation. You can see this in, in St. Paul's teaching throughout the scripture, of course, but in St. Paul in particular, when he gives this beautiful uh, reflection on the mystery of Christ in the first chapter of Ephesians, I want to bring your attention to it. He says this, after kind of speaking about the richness of Christ and all the blessings that have come to him, to the church through him, he says this, he has let us know the mystery of his purpose. But just think. Christ has let us know the mystery of his purpose. You know, we live in a world where there's so much agnosticism, so much, well, who knows what it's all about? And Paul makes it very clear that Christ has let us know the mystery of his purpose. In fact, he goes on to say, the hidden plan he so kindly made in Christ from the beginning plan to act upon when times had run their course to the end. And what is this plan? He says this, that he would bring everything together under Christ his head, everything in the heavens and everything on earth. But this is the, the ultimate goal of Christ. And as I say at the beginning of my little reflection, the goal of divinization, that God is gathering together his creation gathering it together in Christ, the God-man, who has united himself to our humanity. And in uniting himself to our humanity, he's united himself to the microcosm of all that exists, both visible and invisible creation. We are angels in the flesh, bodies and spirit. And so in, in, in the human being, is encompassed a whole microcosm of all that exists. Christ has united that humanity, that human nature, to his divine nature in, his, in himself, in his person. And he's wedded it in himself. And that's what scripture reveals about Christ, that that's his whole purpose, is to wed the creation. And we see it from the very beginning. The beginning of the book of scripture, the beginning of the Bible and book of Genesis begins with a wedding and the last book of scripture ends with the wedding with the with the wedding of the bride of christ coming out from heaven to be wedded by her bridegroom her savior jesus christ that theme is a kind of thematic thread that runs through all of scripture and we see it constantly it's so embedded in scripture and so much part of the mind of the church in her liturgy, for example, as a priest in the Byzantine tradition, the first vestment I put on as a priest is what we call a stikar. In the Roman church, they would call it an elm. And it's, it's the ancient baptismal garment that links us with our baptism. And the prayer that I use to put that elm on, the, the vestment prayer goes like this. Uh, my soul rejoices in the Lord. My spirit exalts in God, my Savior. I'll give it to you exactly. My soul shall be joyful in the Lord, for he has clothed me with the garment of salvation and the robe of gladness he has wrapped around me. He has placed on me as a bridegroom a crown. He has adorned me as a bride Jesus. But the very first vestment, the baptismal vestment that the priest wears, is already associated with the ultimate goal of what even the Eucharist ultimately is all about. The ultimate divine wedding of creation with her creator. That is the work that 
Jesus Christ has come to do. This gathering, Greek, the term is anakephaliosis. Irenaeus of Lyon was a great, uh, uh, reflected greatly on this mystery, anakephaliosis, that everything is recapitulated in Christ. St. Pius X used that on his model, that all things will be gathered together in Christ. And it's in that gathering that Christ is bringing everything together. That we find the ultimate, we could say, image for what marriage is meant to be. It's, it's there that Christian marriage finds its prototype. It's there where it, it sees its purpose. And it's there that it becomes, when it's lived out, this prophetic image in the world of the divine plan. That God is wedding his creation. We are called all to be gathered together in that. The feast where the celebration will never end. So I don't want to extend my meditation too far, but I just, I just want to leave you with those, those, that initial thought that as you reflect on the importance of prayer and worship in marriage, um, obviously as the statistics I gave you already show the importance of that, that you see it for what it is, an icon of the ultimate divine plan of God for his creation. And um, that because it precisely is that, the Lord will give all the grace necessary for those who turn to him to live that out. So let me give you a blessing to conclude and uh, to carry on with these reflections coming up with um, your speaker this evening. It's Patty, right? Or Jen? Yes, Patty. Yeah. Pat Patty. So this is a prayer from a service that we use in the um, Byzantine tradition for anniversaries of marriage. It goes like this. Lord our God, you be close to church, a pure virgin, called from among the nations. Bless and preserve these your servants gathered at the time. For you have willed to watch over them from the time of their social and marriage even to Fulfill every request of those for which is good. And as you are a generous and loving God, so forth upon them your great mercy and compassion. Grant unto them health, length of days, and success in all of their good and good. Make them by your grace, who I claim the divine plan, gather all creation to this plan, and to let it in the peace that will never end. You are the God of life. You bless us with love and love. And bless to the future given. And give glory to you, the Father and the Son, now and ever. Amen. 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 the Amen. 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 The prayers of the Holy Mother who is there calls us to do everything that we can. May the Lord bless you, sanctify you, watch over you, and love you, and fill you with his strength and his joy. We need all to see those things in the Holy Name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Uh, you know what? I'm wondering, I, I couldn't hear part of that. So, I don't, or quite a bit of it. What do you think, Paul? I'm just. Uh, you know what? Why don't Why don't we ask Father if he can, um, if he could direct me to where I can find that because it's printed. beautiful. And I just we'll, the little we'll, bits we'll, that I heard. We'll, we'll We'll send it out to everybody. Okay. Yeah, okay, like a, that would be great because it's just like sometimes it was just ebb and flow, like we could only hear part of it. But it was yeah, the parts that I heard were so beautiful. Okay, but that'd be great if everyone could read it. Okay. again later that would be lovely right, would you mind sending that then to paul sure i will i'll send for you thank you so okay, much thank you. okay very good thank you thank you father it's wonderful to see you again father Tedos. and and just to bring us oh, to, 
to bring us right to the heart of everything. Uh, it's just, um, you know, that the beautiful vision and, and bringing together all of scripture and all of creation. And thank you for setting the context for this, for setting the context for why prayer, why worship is absolutely essential. So mm -hmm. we really appreciate you doing that for us. Thank you Good. for your presence. Thank you so Father. much. All right. Well, I will thank you again. Okay. God bless you. And I will, I will move you here on to be an attendee. And thanks again. Okay. It's beautiful. Very good. All right. All right. Bye bye. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. So here we go. I am just delighted that Patty Schneier is with us today. I met her and I can't remember which year it was, but I think it was like around eight years ago, eight or nine years ago. Is that right? More. probably. Oh, maybe <laughs> 10, maybe 10. It was a long time ago. And yeah. so, and Patty, Patty has been up here in Canada uh, a few times and I've seen her a couple of the times when she's been up. And I, you know, I don't know. I, I think you're all going to just fall in love with her like I did. I think most people do. <laughs> um, but she's, because she's a vibrant woman and a lifelong Catholic, just cares so much about her faith. She's a housewife, mom of three. Um, she and Larry are really active in their parish. She is from St. Louis. I always get that wrong. No, St. Louis. It's not St. Yeah. Louis. Yeah, St. Louis. No, okay. St. Louis, Missouri. St. Louis, Missouri. Yes. And she's been speaking at parishes and Catholic conferences all around North America, mostly the United States, but up here too. And uh, and actually what Father Teodosi had said that he remembered her from a very famous uh, talk that she did because it actually went out. It was on on her conversion and she'll share a little bit with it a little bit about that with us um uh you know how god got a hold of her and and larry too and it's called prove it god and he did and that went around to a whole diocese of bismarck north dakota and um so i've really appreciated patty's witness to her faith she talks on a whole bunch of different topics and i remembered so much i had the privilege of traveling with her just to a few spots um, when she was here in Alberta, and I re really was struck by her talk on prayer. I think that was in Cold Lake, and I thought that would be a perfect way to end up this, well, it would have been perfect at any time, but it's, it is really nice that it worked out for the last session, because I think we need to be called, as Father Tedosi said, we need, how important is prayer? I mean, like, that's essential to our lives with Christ, but it's also just so essential to our marriage. So uh, actually, Patty's done a lot of other wonderful things too. She's been on EW10, a lot of Catholic radio. And one thing that I think would be, would have been really a privilege too, is that she got to have several conversations with Cardinal Raymond Burke in a radio show that she hosted called Ask the Archbishop. He is such a, a magnificent Cardinal. We're so grateful for him. And she's also written a book um, love letters from mom on what matters most. And so now she's working especially with, um, uh, let's see, what is, it's a weekly radio show called The Pearl of Great Price, uh, specifically on vocations. And so we are so delighted that you're here, Patty, and we really appreciate that. And so thank you for coming and for sharing with us about the importance of prayer and helping us to enrich our lives that way. My pleasure. Um, I want to thank you for inviting me to be a part of this virtual conference. And um, it's been a joy to just reconnect with you and Paul, because that mm -hmm. was such a joy when I came up to Canada to get to meet both of you. Um, the joy of public ministry for me is meeting people all over mm -hmm. in parishes. And um, so my life, I say I'm the richest person in the world simply because of the people that have come into my life through ministry mm -hmm. and Larry's to our whole family. We've just benefited from so many wonderful new friends and acquaintances all over in the church and to see the church in so many different areas has been a blessing. So um, I want to welcome any couples, all couples who are joining us tonight or who will listen to this uh, in the future at their own convenience at their own time. And thank you for caring enough about your marriage that you want to grow and learn and be a lifelong learner. Um, my husband, Larry, and I, we have been married for 32 years. Actually, wait a minute. It'll be 33 very soon. And um, 
our journey has just been one, an incredible journey. I have to just as by way of introduction, just so you know kind of where I'm coming from. Larry and I are both Catholics. We were we knew each other since high school. He was the first person I met when I was 14 years old. Um, I ended up marrying this guy. I did not think I would marry the guy sitting behind me in geometry class, <laughs> but I did. <laughs> and and um, we started our journey together. We were both born and raised Catholics. We sent our kids to Catholic schools. We considered ourselves to be very active, involved in parish life from day one, from day one, super involved in our parish, lived up there. And um, but unfortunately, what we did was we patted ourselves on the back and considered ourselves to be this good Catholic family. Um, however, there was an area in our life where we were dissenting from the church. It was this one little small issue, so we thought, that we just didn't really like about the Catholic Church's teachings, and um, it was the issue of contraception. And so for the first 13 years of our marriage, we were, like many, many, many modern-day Catholics, we were contracepting Catholics, and we thought it was no big deal. We thought we could still, you know, we were still sitting in the second pew every Sunday, sending our kids to the school, doing everything. And we just, we just ignored this. We completely ignored this issue until 2002, which um, when everything came to a head, I started wrestling, wrestling with this issue because of a parish mission we attended. And it was simply to just sit down every day with the daily readings of the church. I, I mean, I had, this was not even on my radar, this issue of marriage and sexuality in the church's teachings. I just wanted to have a quiet prayer time by myself. I was 36 years old. My kids were nine, seven, and four years old at the time. And on January 9th, 2002, for the first time in my life, I sat down in my rocking chair at 6.30 in the morning and opened up the daily readings to have a quiet prayer time. That's what started my own personal journey of prayer and led to a huge conversion because on day two, on day two, I was so proud of myself, day two of prayer, right? I was patting myself on the back um, and I sat down and this is the scripture that just rocked our world. It was from the daily readings of the church, 1 John 5, 3, which says, this is love for God to obey his commands and his commands are not burdensome. And that word burdensome really just struck a chord with me immediately. And I just said, no way, give me a break. Because I knew in my mind that the church's teachings on sex and marriage and contraception to me were a burden. So that's what started this wrestling match, if you will. I, I started wrestling with God, arguing with God. I did not want to look at this. I didn't want to go near it. I didn't want to touch it. But day by day, it was this almost like hitting me over the head with a two by four. It's a long story, but I'll make it short. Eventually, what happened was a friend of mine gave me a book by Christopher West. Good news about sex and marriage answers to your honest questions about Catholic teaching. And from there, we started diving into John Paul II's Theology of the Body. And the, the books by Christopher West just pierced our hearts about what was true and good and beautiful about real love, authentic love. I wanted the marriage that was in those books. And so on, I can tell you the exact day, it was January 25th, 2002. I went to the Sacrament of Reconciliation. My husband read Christopher West's book the very next day. He too went to the Sacrament of Reconciliation. And that night on January 26, 2002, we threw out the contraception. That was the best decision that we ever made for our marriage, for our family life, and for our faith life. That's what started this whole thing. But what I want to talk to you tonight about is what happened next. You see, because after this conversion, we thought, okay, God's going to leave us alone now. We dove into the theology of the body. We were changing so many things in our marriage, about our, our physical life, our spiritual life. Everything changed. Everything changed in light of this new vision, as Father Teodosi said, this new vision of what marriage was supposed to be, right? This icon, this sign of the Trinity and of God's love in our marriage. We wanted it. We just wanted it. So what happened was, is that conversion was just the tip of an iceberg. And what happened next 
in our life was this explosion of prayer. We could not get enough. We just couldn't get enough of diving into everything of our Catholic faith that had been right in front of our face our whole lives. And all of a sudden we saw it in a new light. It was like a new set of glasses to see everything, the mass, the rosary, everything, the saints, all of this, we were realizing we experienced God in and through our bodies. The theology of the body just changed our whole outlook. And we just couldn't get enough of everything physical, the candles, the bells, the incense of our Catholic faith, the gestures, the sacraments, all outward physical signs, right? So it became so important for us to just dive into our faith. And we did this together as a couple. Um, but so I want to talk to you tonight about that prayer journey and what that looked like and the impact that it had on our marriage and how we raised our kids. It was a game changer. It truly transformed everything, not only the conversion, but the prayer life that the two of us, both as individuals, we decided to foster and give ourselves our own interior life in solitude with God but then as a couple and how important that was. So I want to talk about a couple of things first, if you don't mind, just some general things about prayer in particular. And the first thing that I would say is that going back to our own conversion story, contraception for us was a wall of dissent. And wherever and whenever there is any wall of dissent, your prayer life can go no further. You will always bump up against that wall of dissent. And for us, like I said, it was contraception, but there are many other issues that couples may face. And I guess I just want to say to anyone out there who has any doubts, struggles with anything that the Catholic church teaches, do not be afraid of your questions. Take them to God, seek answers, read, listen to podcasts, do whatever it is, whatever it is your hot button issue is, actually start there because that's exactly where God wants to meet you in that doubt, in that frustration, in that struggle. What is it for you? What is it for you in your marriage? That has to be addressed first. Because again, all I can say is once our wall of descent fell, and that's what happened, contraception, it was our wall of descent and it crumbled. Then it just opened, and I mean opened the doors of our hearts and our marriage and our, our love for each other and for God and the church and, and the teachings. And that's when our faith life and our prayer, law, prayer life then could just skyrocket. It just took off. So that's what I have to say, first of all, is do not be afraid of any dissent that you may have. God is so much bigger than our doubts and our fears and our questions. He wants to meet you right there. Seek answers. Ask other married couples. Talk to a priest. Talk to a couple that maybe can mentor you or help you, whether it's sterilization, whether it's pornography, whatever it is. Get the answers to those questions. And, and, and see if those walls of dissent can't fall. That's the first thing I wanna say before you even start to go on a journey of prayer. The second thing about prayer, I would like to say this, is that intimacy with God, intimacy with God will lead to intimacy in your marriage. And men, if I could speak to you in particular, your wife is craving intimacy. And it's so hard for many men to open up in this area. And many couples think that the most intimate thing that they can do is that spousal union, the sexual embrace. But I would argue that the most intimate thing that you can do in your marriage is pray together. Why? Because prayer is the window to the soul. And uniting yourself together in prayer 
your spirit, your psychological, your emotional, everything, your whole person. Only then when you, when a woman feels closely connected to you emotionally and spiritually, can she then really open herself up to you physically as well? And I would say that this intimacy in prayer also is so important because what you are doing is inviting God into your marriage, into every single aspect of your marriage, from doing the dishes to cutting the grass to getting out the door every morning for work. When you pray together, you are inviting God to just be a part of all of it. But it will lead to more intimacy in your marriage, the more you are intimate with God. So I just want to say that as a, as, a, as a background information about prayer. And then the third thing I would say before we even get to the practical tips and suggestions for married couples in praying together in your marriage, the third tip or general thing I want to say about prayer is that you have to find what works for you. What works for Larry and me may not work for you and your spouse. Do not be afraid to try different ways of praying together. Um, there are some married couples who will swear on their life that they cannot live, that the best thing ever for them is praying the rosary together as a couple. Awesome. Absolutely awesome. For Larry and me, praying the rosary together as a couple what did not work for us. We are very, very different in how we pray the rosary. He prays the rosary when he's working out in the morning and taking a bike ride. I pray the rosary when I'm in my car. I pray the rosary when I'm taking a walk. I pray the rosary after mass every morning. We both pray a daily rosary. But for us, it just didn't work for us to do that together. Now, some of you may be listening saying, well, then she's a failure. How, why is she talking to us about prayer? They don't even say a rosary together. I'm just saying, I'm in, in all honesty, you have to find what works for you as a couple. And what I'm going to recommend, again, I can only speak from my own experience of what has worked for us. So I'm going to share that. But if you find something that works for you as a couple, go with that, run with that. You have to know your temperaments. You have to know your complementarity. Certain prayers are more structural. Some people may be more comfortable praying from the heart. It doesn't matter in a certain sense of whatever the, the structure or non-structure, it's whatever works for you as a couple. When you unite yourself, your heart, your mind, your soul, your day, your life, your family to God, and you are turning to God, and being vulnerable together and praying together, however that is that's going to work for you, is the best way for you to pray as a couple. So anything that I can say to you or can be tips to get you started, can be ways to help you maybe grow or maybe offer suggestions that you've never thought about before. And that would be the final thing I want to just say about prayer in general, is we're all lifelong learners. Don't get stuck. Don't get stagnant. Be willing to be open, to change, to grow. That's key in our prayer life. We don't want to stay at a first grade education in our faith life. We don't want to stay, you know, we want to always be growing, growing deeper and deeper. And prayer is inexhaustible. It's inexhaustible. And that's the beauty of marriage too, right? Your marriage is inexhaustible. Your journey is inexhaustible. You're always trying new things and learning things together. Because life is different at different stages in your marriage. Again, what works for me right now, our children are grown. We're empty nesters. I'm going to share some things we did when our kids were young. And some, you know, just how we've grown with this based on our state in life and where we are. So I want to just be very honest about that, that it changes. And that what worked five years ago may not work now. And what works now may not work when our kids were young. So you got to be able to and be willing to to keep experimenting together. So those are just some background things I wanna say about prayer before we even begin. And I'm sorry that was a long intro, but um, I think that's kind of important to just kind of set that groundwork first. Okay. Um, so the first, I'm gonna just talk about some ways of praying together as a couple. I'm gonna cover three, if I can, uh, three general things. And if we have time, I can do some more, but I, I always try to just give 
three. So for you to think about, and maybe what I would recommend for you as a couple is um, pick one, pick one thing to think about, pray about, and maybe that you might think, you know, that might work for us or change it a little bit and see how it might fit in with your family life, with your schedule, with whatever it is that's going on in your life right now. So the first thing I want to say, the easiest way to get started, and I'm going to, I mean, I know we might have a big spectrum here of people that are already praying together a lot and maybe a couple that has never really prayed together. I mean, they may go to mass on Sunday together, but they may not in their family really ever pray together. So I'm, I've got a spectrum here, but I'm going to start at the very beginning. Here's what I would recommend for someone, for a couple that has never really prayed together. The easiest way to get started is at your dinner table, right at your own dinner table. And especially if you have children, this is so beautiful. Because of course, many of us, we can say grace, bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy body through Christ our Lord, amen, right? Let's eat. Well, you're right there, you're saying grace, but this is one thing that we've done from the very, very beginning in our marriage is we go around the table and everyone says what they're thankful for, who they wanna pray for. It can be 30 seconds, but every single person does just say something from the heart. But here's what I wanna recommend because I can tell you, it's one of my most favorite things, to be honest, of our daily rhythm of our life is every night at the dinner table, for 32 years, 33 years now, I have heard my husband say something to this effect every night. Thank you, God, for Patty and our marriage. Thank you for this food, for this meal that she has prepared. Thank you that I get to have dinner with my wife tonight. Thank you for all that she does. I, and whatever, he goes on and on and on. He starts off the prayer every night at the dinner table. Thanking God for me and our marriage. Do you know how that makes me feel? To hear him say out loud to God that he's thanking God for the gift of me and the meal. He's not taking it for granted. I feel cherished. I feel nurtured. I feel appreciated at every single dinner. It's never a chore for me to cook dinner for my husband. It's never a chore. I, I love to do it. Or when we cook together, thank you, God, for this meal. Thank you that we got just got to cook together. But here's the beauty. Then I, of course, kind of say something similar. Thank you, God, for Larry. Thank you for our marriage. Thank you for all his hard work today. Thank you for his job that provides for our family, that provides this food on our table. And then I go on to pray for whoever it is in our family that needs prayers, whatever. But that's how we started. But here's the deal. This is what I want to recommend to all married couples, especially if you have young kids. Do you know that our children every night heard their mother and their father thank God for the gift of marriage? And they knew every single day of their lives that we are madly in love with each other and we are thanking God for the gift of our marriage. And of course, we thank God for our children too and our blessings. But just at the dinner table, it takes two minutes. But the ripple effect of that over 30 years is huge. And it's huge for your kids to see that and to participate in that and to just learn to say, thank you, God, for I won my baseball game today. Thank you, God, that I got to go you know, to my friend's house, praying for grandma who's going to have surgery. What all is going on in our life at the dinner table? It's so simple. It's so basic. But honestly, if you've never prayed together as a couple, that's the easiest, the easiest way to just start. Because many people find it difficult. But men, again, I'm going to talk a lot to the men because you got to take the lead on this. Step up to the plate. Don't just say grace. Just say, you know what, tonight, let's just, you can start tomorrow. Let's just go around the table and just say something that we're thankful for. And by literally verbalizing that you're thankful for your marriage, 
is huge. It's huge. So that's the first thing just at the dinner table. Again, these are not, these are not very theological. I'm a very practical down to earth person. So again, that's a very basic, easy way. And some of you may be saying, well, this is, I, we've been doing that for years. Great. Okay. Here's another, again, tip or suggestion for couples that for us was a game changer. This may or may not work for you, but I just want to recommend it. Okay. Again, on all things, you've got to weigh this with what state of life you're in and if it will work for you. So a huge part of my own, um, my own prayer life was I would drop my kids off at school and we have a perpetual adoration chapel. And I started having my morning prayer time, just again, me in solitude with God alone. As I would drop my kids off at school, I would just stop in our adoration chapel. So I started going to Eucharistic adoration every single day. Sometimes five minutes, sometimes 10 minutes. I mean, I still had a, a list, a to-do list a mile along every day, but I just started going, which is kind of ironic because we had been parishioners at our parish for 11 years before I ever set foot in our Eucharistic Adoration Chapel. I just didn't grow up with adoration. I didn't really know about it, but discovering it was just a tremendous grace and a blessing. So I started going to adoration and falling in love with Jesus in the Eucharist and just sitting face to face with him and bringing him everything. And I would start journaling um, in adoration. And I can tell you this, my family noticed, they noticed because whenever I was crabby, whenever I was losing my temper, whatever, they would start to say, mom, why don't you just go to chapel? go, go to chapel, right? Go leave. Or Larry would say, Patty, why don't you, have you been to chapel today? You know, why don't you go to chapel? What changed was never my outward circumstances. I mean, the circumstances of my life were always the same. What changed was my perspective by right? just sitting in the presence of Jesus. You know, you cannot hold on to bitterness, anger, and frustration when you're sitting face to face with all truth, goodness, beauty, and love, which is what the Eucharist is, what Jesus is. He's all truth, goodness, beauty, and love right there personified. So sitting there, I like to give this image. Sitting in Eucharistic adoration is like sitting under Niagara Falls. If you've ever been to Niagara Falls, we went to the Cave of the Mist where you put the poncho on and you go up and you feel the mist, right? And then you get closer and then you kind of feel it coming down on you. And then up on this balcony, it's just coming so hard, it's almost blowing you off the deck. And then you realize you're not even really in the falls. You're in this little side trickle. Well, I always say when I walk into Eucharistic adoration, it's like I want to walk into Niagara Falls because the graces that are flowing are more powerful than Niagara Falls. And they just keep coming and coming and coming. He's the God of the universe that created Niagara Falls. And the graces flowing from his precious body are just, they just keep coming like Niagara Falls. And when I walk into Eucharistic adoration, I want to just get soaking wet, right? Just let those graces fall. So I started going to adoration. Here's what I want to tell you. For seven years, I went to adoration by myself in the morning. I just went. Larry went off to work. I was as a stay-at-home mom. I would go drop my kids off at school, and I went to adoration. And then one night, Larry said, don't you think we ought to have a holy hour together? And I said, yes, I would love to have a holy hour together. And they had signups and sure enough, Tuesday nights, nine o'clock was open. They needed someone. And so this has been, gosh, 13 years ago. I don't even know how many years ago now that we started going to Eucharistic adoration committed every Tuesday night, nine o'clock is our time when we go to Eucharistic adoration together. We consider that our date, our date with God. And I, again, this is how it works for us. I take my contacts out. I've got my glasses on. I've brushed my teeth. I am almost ready for bed, right? We go to adoration. Our kids at the time were still in school, but they were old enough that we, I was done with the driving, done with the homework, done picking up from basketball or baseball. And they could just, you know, finish up their homework or whatever for one hour. Mom and dad are going up to chapel and we're going to go up there and we're going to pray for our family. And our kids grew up knowing 
every Tuesday night, that's where mom and dad are. They still, they're adults now. They know where we are on Tuesday nights at nine o'clock. We're in adoration. And at 10 o'clock, when we walk out of adoration, you want to know what Larry says to me? Still says it. Thanks for our date. Thanks for our date. We sit there in adoration together in silence. We're both of us in silence. But we're praying for our family. We're praying for our kids. We're bringing to him everything of that week, of the day. And let's face it, you know, sometimes there could be tension, right? We know what just happened yesterday in our marriage. We go to adoration together and we just give it all to God. And you cannot hold on to that bitterness and that resentment and those grudges. I mean, we can just look at each other with a war, with just a glance there in front of Jesus, knowing he forgives us. I forgive you. I'm sorry. You're sorry. Here we are. Hold my hand, just a squeeze of the hand as there we are in front of Jesus. No words even spoken. It's such, for lack of a better word, a game changer. Week after week after week, together, the two of us, bringing everything to face to face with Jesus. So find when you can go. And I will say, if you start just going yourself, if you, if you, if you have to, you know, maybe your husband travels, maybe you're, who knows what it is. Go, go, go. Start going for five minutes, 10 minutes. If you're a young couple with young children, I always say, get another couple and share and swap. Even if it's every other week, you go this week, I'll go the next week. We'll watch each other's kids. Have that date with God. He's the one that gave you to each other, right? I, I just want, I don't want a week to go by without thanking God face to face for everything that's happened in our life. And here's the other Thing. again I think it's so important but it's so true when you go as a couple you'll start to bring your kids you'll drive by Eucharistic Adoration Chapel maybe your kids are young they're in the car maybe someone just made the soccer team or made the cheerleading squad or made the play and I would start pulling in the parking lot and the kids would say where are we going so let's just stop in and thank Jesus or someone in the family is having surgery or needs prayers or has cancer, driving by, pull in the parking lot. Let's just stop in for five minutes and pray. They need prayers. And I would do that with my kids. And we do it with Larry on a Saturday. Let's just stop in for chapel for five minutes. Let's pray for your mom. Let's pray for your dad. We would do that together. Here's what I want to tell you. The fruit of this over the span of years. Your children will know where to go. Do they know where to go in the greatest joys and sorrows of life? Where do you go? Our kids knew where to go. When our youngest son was discerning where to go to college, he couldn't decide which college. It was a very tough decision for me. It was a hard time in his life. At 1030 at night, he came down one night. I remember he got, he grabbed his car keys and I said, where are you going at 1030 at night? You know, we do not go out at 1030 at night. And he looked at me, he goes, mom, I got to figure this out. I got to decide on which college I'm going to adoration. I'm going to chapel. And I remember saying, go. Our daughter, the night she got engaged, she and her husband went out to dinner, celebrated. We were waiting back home with a surprise party for them. And we're waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting. Wondering, Where are they? Where are they? They walk in and said, sorry, we're sorry. We were all like, surprise. You know, we had this big surprise party for them. For their engagement, they had been in adoration. The two of them on the night of their engagement wanted to go to adoration. Our son discerning the priesthood. Cardinal Burke always said it, you will find your vocation in front of the blessed sacrament. All I can tell you is that Eucharistic adoration, the ripple effect, again, the graces that Larry and I have received are priceless, are priceless. But the ripple effect that we now see in our children to know that they go to adoration and the joys and sorrows of life, I, I can't even put to words what that means. So I want to suggest again, this is, this is really good. If, if one of you is not comfortable praying out loud, you don't have to, 
right? Go sit in front of, of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. Go sit. You'd be surprised at what happens in that silence. But this is the two of you together being there together. That is so beautiful. So um, that's what I want to just recommend. Again, Eucharistic Adoration. And now I realize that for some of you are saying, well, our parish doesn't have it every week. What do we do? What do we do? Find, find where there's adoration close to you. It might not be your own parish in particular. You might have to drive. It's worth it. So all I can say is it's worth it. Find where there's an adoration chapel that works for your schedule that you can go to and make it a date, make it a date. So that again was a game changer for us. Okay, then the third, the third area of praying together as a couple. And um, this also, again, I could talk about so many different aspects of prayer, but this was the, another, the three biggest game changers, biggest influences in our marriage. And this was praying together as a couple in our own bed together at night. This is where after the, we did not do this always. We did not always do this. We did this after our conversion and the discovery of the theology of the body. We did this because we struggled. We struggled with all of the counterfeits that were in our marriage. And we wanted authentic love. We wanted love that was free, total, faithful, and fruitful. We wanted to be a sincere gift to each other. But to be honest, we didn't know how to get there, right? You did, sometimes you just don't know how to get there. You know what you want, but you don't know how to get there. And we saw this vision through the theology of the body, but we were still in the muck of our daily lives. And knowing of the counterfeits that we had fallen for with contraception and then the ripple effect of that in our marriage, our attitudes, our tendencies, our habits, our temptations, all of this was something that we had to peel layer after layer after layer and let God into that to transform our hearts so that we could love each other rightly. That's what we needed to learn how to do. And so what we started to do, because we didn't know what else to do, was in our own marriage bed before we would ever come together physically, Larry would just hold me and speak again, something to the effect of Lord, thank you for my wife. Help me to love her rightly. May this union be free, faithful, total, and fruitful. May this union be a glimpse, a glimpse of the sign of your love. We ask you to enter into our hearts right now. We would pray that our marriage would be a light in this world and that this union would bring us closer to each other and closer to God. And that we would be a sincere gift to each other. Larry would pray that, I would pray that. Before we would ever unite physically, we would pray together from the heart. And slowly but surely, the desire of our hearts changed for this authentic love. And slowly but surely, I began to open up more fully to receive the gift of my husband's love. And he was able to love me rightly and be a sincere gift. And it was because night after night after night, we would just pray from the depths of our hearts that we wanted to love each other rightly. And that we wanted our marriage to be a true witness in the world. And we wanted to be a light. And we wanted all of those things that I mentioned. What we did not realize, what we did not realize is that we were actually creating our own spousal creed. That's our spousal creed. It's personal. For Larry and for me, it's only for Larry, only for Larry's words are only for me and for God. And we're inviting God into that. But what we learned from the theology of the body by studying at the Institute um, is that when we, when we looked at the um, scripture store in the book of Tobit, Tobias and Sarah, and many times the story of Tobias and Sarah is used 
in wedding, that prayer of Tobias on their wedding night. And if you're not familiar with that story, it's Sarah has had, you know, six other husbands or seven, six or seven husbands, I think six, and they've all died on the wedding night. And Tobias is willing to marry her. And she's already weeping, thinking, am I going to go through this again? Right. Am I going to go through this again? And Tobias is wondering, am I going to die tonight? I mean, her father-in-law is out there digging the grave already for him. And so what is he going to do when he's facing this life or death is he prays, he prays with his wife that he will not take her in lust, but actually love her rightly. And he lives. And I truly believe that the power of that spousal prayer together in the marriage bed, where we are facing the forces of life and death, where Satan wants to put a wedge right between us and wants those counterfeits to enter our marriage. Are we going to resist that? Are we going to pray that we can be open to God's grace, to the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life in our marriage, that we will love each other rightly? And by doing that, night after night after night after night, that has become our spousal creed. And I believe that that prayer is the what is the glue, is the cement. It's the power of God's grace it working in and through our marriage. The power of that prayer is stronger than death itself. It is. Again, the powers of life and death are at stake in every spousal union. Will we speak life? Will we be part of the culture of life? Will we invite the Lord, the giver of life to be a part of this union or not? And so praying then and there in the marriage bed before any physical union ever takes place, we unite our hearts, our souls, our minds together. The unity of that, I can't even begin to put into words. All I can tell you is um, I am more in love with my husband now than I've ever been before. Our love and our marriage, my love and respect for him has skyrocketed because he takes the lead on that. He holds me when he says those words. Talk about safety, security, knowing till death do us part, that nothing, 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 nothing can ever come between us. And that's because no matter what happened earlier in that day, we speak our marriage vows with our mouth, but we speak them with our body, yes, but we actually are reaffirming our marriage vows together. Every time that we come together, we pray and we unite them and we thank God for our marriage in that moment. So again, that's all I can say, it's from the heart. This is how, this is the glue that has kept our marriage for for all of these years. Um, Those are the three biggest areas. Around the dinner table takes two minutes. Eucharistic adoration together in silent prayer before God as a committed time once a week at least. And then again, bringing your children throughout the time, you know, in and out of chapel all the time. I go to chapel every day, again, as my own personal prayer life. But as a couple, it's been crucial. And then that our own spousal creed. If you've never as a couple pray together, maybe, maybe you need to write it down. Maybe write down your spousal creed, what you would like. Maybe maybe just write from your heart and give that to each other. What a beautiful way to start. If, if you're not comfortable yet, I know it can be hard to start praying out loud. I know that can be difficult. So if it works for you that both of you write, write down what you want the prayer of your marriage to be. Start maybe with that. Start with two minutes. Start with 30 seconds, just start. So that's really um, what I was going to talk about tonight. I hope that that's okay. (laughs) Um, And of course, there's so many other things about prayer. Again, the rosary is an important part of our family life, but we do pray ours separately. We pray it every day. The Chapel of Divine Mercy, the saints, um, just so many areas of prayers. Um, I recommend people getting the Laudate or any app on their phone. 
I recommend people reading the daily readings every morning. Um, Larry and I do all of those things. You know, we talk about the daily readings in the morning before we ever even, you know, go downstairs. We, we read the daily readings first thing and he'll say, oh, today's the feast of so-and-so and the gospel today. You know, we talk about the daily readings together. That's part of our prayer life too. It's been a beautiful part of our prayer life. But I just wanted to focus on those main three um, and see if that might be helpful for um, anyone listening tonight. So. Oh, yeah, that was great. Thank beautiful. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing and really important and so good. And I got so I much just, out of that. Oh, I'm go ahead. Just curious, Patty, in the last year and a bit, you know, during all this COVID stuff, did you ever run into problems with church closures, you not being able to get inside a church? Because that's been an issue for many Catholics in Canada and some parts of the United States. What was your experience in this past year? Um, our churches were closed for a while from again the year ago it was march through the end of may but it was really only about eight weeks the okay. churches were closed yeah. um and very blessed that after those eight weeks of churches being closed um and but again i started just going on prayer walks we just started right. going on prayer walks we yeah. started to you know prayer i i walked i'm not kidding you 10 10 12 miles a day Five miles in the morning, I got bored again by three o'clock, five miles again. I was praying the rosary, the chaplet, stations of the cross, everything I could, I'd just be walking. I walked in cemeteries. I walked everywhere um, during the shutdown. We called it the shutdown, which was about eight weeks. We were very blessed in our parish that once the shutdown was over and the churches were opened, of course, we had every other pew. You had to wear a mask. I mean, there was all kinds of restrictions, but that didn't matter to me. I would we opened up our chapel we only allowed three people in at a time you had to sit in certain places the doors had to i mean there were all kinds of restrictions in our adoration chapel but praise god um that they opened it back up and so i could go to adoration and i've been going through this whole pandemic i have that's so great. again i i know that that's very very fortunate and i was blessed uh, to be able to do that and i know I, I can't take that for granted by any means and, and i will say this our chapel is not perpetual we have not re reopened back through the nights we're open the, but seven days a week until 10 o'clock at night you know in the morning through 10 o'clock at night so very very good chunk of the day is mm -hmm. available for people to stop in in our adoration chapel that's we have a question in the q a yes sure. thank you i just saw that one do you want to read it or should i john oh go ahead okay Question is, um, how do we encourage our children to grow with us in our faith? How do we handle situations where they want to choose their own faith journey, i.e., that is, um, unbelieving at the moment? Well, um, I'm kind of of the mindset that, um, let me just, I got to think about this carefully, how I'm going to say this. Um, your child would, even if a teenager, let's, I'm, a, I'm gonna kind of assume probably a teenager or somewhat old enough to say, I don't wanna do this anymore. Um, by living in your house, your child, uh, if the, your child said, I'm, I'm not gonna eat anymore ever, I'm gonna go on a starvation diet, eventually you as a parent would step in. There's no way you were gonna let your child starve. You just wouldn't do it. And you would look at your child and say, I am accountable to God. I am not going to let you starve. You will not starve on, on my watch. You're not going to starve on my watch. Well, without the Eucharist, your child is starving. Un unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life within you. But whoever eats my body and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. When my kids at first asked me, you know, why do we have to go to Mass? This is why. This is why. You have to be very, very bold and articulate what is at stake here. And on my watch, under my, if you're living in my house, this is who we are. And it's not so much of a rule and a regulation, it's what, this is what we get to do. You are the luckiest person in the world that you get to go to mass, that you get to receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so I think it starts very, very young, but very intentional. Um, and some things are non-negotiable. 
I say that in all sincerity, but my kids knew there were some things that were non-negotiable. For example, when our son wanted to play travel baseball, right? He was a pitcher and, you know, travel baseball was tournaments out of town, weekends and, you know, all baseball at every single waking moment. I remember saying to him, I think he was 13, the day you miss Sunday mass to pitch in a baseball game is the day you've pitched your last baseball game. It's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And my husband was willing. I remember this too. You have to be willing to put your money where your mouth is. You got to be willing to make the sacrifices. And this might mean, again, if your kids are involved in activities, they play sports on this weekend, that weekend, there's tournaments. I remember my husband once we were going to send our son with another family just so we didn't have to go to this tournament. And then my husband realized that family's not going to get him to mass. And so he was willing to drive 200 miles, pay for a hotel, all to take my son to this baseball tournament. Why? Because he was going to find a church that had a mass at 7 a.m. in the morning and go to mass before that 9 a.m. baseball game. And no other parent was going to do that. So my husband was willing to do that. That's how you have to show the importance, the priority. Um, and, and, and I would just keep always, always showing that everything I do, everything I do for you as a parent, there's only one goal, one goal for me as your mother. There's only one thing that's most important and it's heaven, 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 heaven. Everything I do, whether it's to drive you here, whether it's to buy you clothes, whether it's to send you to this school, what, no matter what it is, there's only one goal, it's heaven. So we were a very very proactive family in that respect i try to encourage parents to be bold and be strong you got to be very very strong but i think it's worth it in the end i i don't know if that's the answer you're looking for but i can only say there are parenting is not for wimps and our catholic faith is not for wimps either and it's not going to be easy I would also say at the same time, although I sound like I'm coming on very harsh, at the same time, we had so much joy with our kids being involved in parish life. Our whole social life, all of their friends, everything was involved in our parish. They wouldn't miss parish picnic. They wouldn't miss the potluck dinners. They wouldn't miss, you know, singing in the children's choir and serving mass because these brought joy. This was also, for lack of a better word, fun. You know, a, a Corpus Christi procession on Corpus Christi, we call up grandma and grandpa, we call up Aunt Peggy, we call up all the cousins, we're all gonna go together and afterwards we're gonna get pizza. Yeah, we're going. And everybody goes, right? For their confirmation when they were in eighth grade, we would go on pilgrimages and they're like, oh, I mean, don't get me wrong. My kids rolled their eyes at me all the time. Oh, do we have to go to this? Oh, do we have to go to this? I'm like, you're going to have fun. You just don't know it yet. And we would do this. We would call the neighbors, call the friends, call the other parishioners, go together, make it fun, go out for ice cream afterwards. That's what we did with our Catholic faith, that it wasn't a burden. It was just as normal as breathing, as normal as breathing and as fun as, as family and social life could be. At 16, I will say this, at 16, again, I mean, my kids were normal teenagers, normal. But I will say this, my, my youngest, I'll never forget it, he just goes, mom, I want the life. Because I want the life that you and dad have. He goes, you guys have so much fun. I'm like, yeah. I go, well, Kevin, you want to know what the life is? The life is the abundant life of God. It's the joy of God. It's the graces of God. It's participating in the life of the church and giving our life rhythm and meaning and, and, and joy. So they have to know where your joy comes from and that that joy comes from the abundant life of Christ and that the church gives us everything that we need we just have to tap into it. So let them see the beauty. Let your joy shine. Let your love and enthusiasm shine. That is more than even the non-negotiable. Although if and when, 
the the rule needs to be there. Well, it's there for a reason. But hopefully you won't even need it. I hope that helps. Thank you. And here's here's something else. Uh, just a suggestion, aside from absolutely requiring mass attendance, um, ask questions as to how the child arrived at unbelief. Maybe the child needs things answered. If you don't have the answers, look for them. Absolutely. Questions are huge. Absolutely huge. Just the, you want to know what a really important question is? What is a human being? Without God, we're just a, a, a body. There's no soul. But with God, we're body and soul. So what is questions like, well, then what does death mean to you? What's the, what's the meaning of life? Very important questions to have around the dinner table. Because let's face it, unbelief leads to nothingness. But again, there's the joy of heaven and everything has meaning and purpose. And oh my gosh, I'm not afraid of death. Right? And, and we're going to see each other again. So those questions, yes, very, very important questions. What is a human being? What is the meaning of life? Where are you headed? What's your destiny? Ask those questions. Very important. Yes. Yeah, thank you for that tip, Susan. I think and I must Susan. say one other thing. Yeah. I must just say one other thing. Is that okay if I say yeah, one other thing? Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me just say this because I know, I know sending kids off to college, scary, right? You've raised them. Maybe they've been in your home. Maybe you've been able to keep them going to church and, and, and everything. And then you just know that within six months of going off to college, who knows, right? Let me just say this. I remember saying this to my kids and I just throw it out there. I just throw it out there. I said, the minute I find out that you are not going to mass anymore is the minute that all, and I mean all financial support for you to go live at some college in some dorms is gone, gone. Because I will not condone a lifestyle that's going to suck you right out of the church. It's not happening. So, Again, they kind of knew <laughs> that, 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 again, just non-negotiable. But I, I will say this, parents, you have more control than you realize. You really do. You have more influence than you realize as well. Mm -hmm. don't, don't waste it, though. Don't waste it. You've got formative years, formative years before they're gone. And then once they are gone, then, then, then that's between them and God. But those formative years, again, my kids knew that I took those formative years very, very seriously and that I was going to be answerable to God on how I raised them. And so I was going to give it all that I had. Yes. Oh, thank you. Are, are there any more questions? Because we it is actually almost time to wrap up. But, um, oh. Patty, this is just, this is, this feels kind of like Niagara Falls right here, what we've been getting. It's awesome. It's just um, the outpouring of your marriage well lived, your prayer life well lived. I mean, this, and, and we all need these, you know, it, no, it's not, it's not complicated. It's not all that hard, but it's, it's consistent, it, consistency and just keeping our focus where it needs to be. And, and that focus, as Father Tedosi was saying, I, I mean, we have to keep, we have to have that eternal perspective. And if we have that eternal perspective faithfully in our own lives and in our marriage, it is going to rub off. And, and we have failures. And, but oh. you know what? I, yeah. So many. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I know. Well, I do. let me just say this, though. I, I, yeah, yeah. Before we finish, yeah. because it is important. The failures in our marriage and with our children are many. Absolutely, there are many. But again, uh, when you're focused and your vision is toward God, it becomes so much easier to say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And again, going to frequent confession. Oh, gosh, I could give a whole talk on confession. But again, your our children seeing us go to confession, knowing that we've blown it, knowing that, you know, that the things have not been so rosy this week. And we just do we just sometimes throw up our hands and say, you know what, let's just both go to confession this week. Let's just, yes. you know, I'll say, I, I need to get up, go to confession. And Larry's like, yeah, I do too. And it's like, yeah, I know you need to go. And so do mm -hmm. I, right? <laughs> um, but going to confession is again, another part. And your children are watching and doing the same thing, offering grace to them when you blow it. 
And I always say, I am so sorry. I am a flawed, flawed mother. I'm so, so sorry how I wound you, but know that you have a perfect mother in heaven, the blessed mother. And I'm hoping she will cover, cover all of my mistakes. Exactly. And I do want to, I actually put in a plug here for actually, uh, we had Dr. Owen Viner speak just on the sacrament of penance for a whole mm -hmm. session. And it was magnificent and beautiful and so essential to our marriages. So I would encourage everyone to listen to that because even though he's a theologian, it wasn't all, it wasn't, well, I mean, it was dense, but it was understandable. And it was just, it, it is so essential to mm -hmm. living our lives in God because as, as Father Bota at the very beginning of the summit said, he said, the first thing that we have to take care of if we want to grow in our marriage, the very first thing we need to take care of is sin. Mm. And, well, and it's true. Yes. It was our conversion yes. to sin. Yes. It's true. We did. Yes. And, and I always say the church gives us everything we need in the sacraments. The church wants us to have a happy, healthy, holy marriage. The church is there to help us in this journey. So through the Eucharist and through the sacrament of reconciliation, all of these things, take advantage of them, tap into them. It's like a treasure chest. Don't just pull out a coin once or twice a year. Just keep diving into the treasure chest. It's all there for us. God wants us to have it all. So I will stop. <laughs> That's well, it. no, no, no. This is so amazing. I, we could keep you going for a week here. I do want to say, because one of the attendees said, Thank you for your wisdom. Appreciate it. So I, I wanted to pass that on. Jonathan, you had something? That was, I was just going to mention that. Oh, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I reiterate that. I just, uh, it's so beautiful. That's how I felt kind of like with all of your talks. I think we're just going to have to keep asking you to talk. <laughs> no, it's just so, because there's this richness and it just kind of comes flowing out. It's awesome. What's that, Paul? I appreciate your enthusiasm, Pat. Mm. That's a lot of fun. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, again, that's mm. just a gift of the Holy Spirit, for sure. Mm. Um, yeah. And I, as I say, I am an ordinary Catholic who has simply fallen in love with Jesus Christ and his church. Yes. And I just can't get enough. And I just want to share the good news with everybody. So whether we're talking about marriage or I'm talking about parenting or I'm talking about the saints or confession or whatever topic it may be, it all goes back to God. It all goes back to how beautiful the church is, how wonderful our faith is, and um, the joy in the journey. And again, coming from a perspective of needing that conversion so desperately, and again, addressing the sin and falling and falling and falling again and again and again, but the struggle of keep getting back up um, is just, I can only say the joy is in the journey, and it's been a beautiful journey. Mm. Another comment. Um, thanks. And any words of advice for parents who didn't do so well, in, in parentheses, regrets? Mm. It's never too late to start. You know what? The Satan wants you to look at your past. You are not defined by your past. You are not defined by your mistakes. You are defined by the sum of the Father's love for you, right? So today, right now, today is a new day. Today, you begin Every day his mercies are new. Every day you start again. You look up. I tell people, quit looking down. Quit mm -hmm. looking at just these circumstances. My life, this, my kids, this, my kids. No, start looking up. Look up. Look at the stars. Look at the sun. Look up. See God. And, and start. Just start. Whether it's tomorrow you're going to start by praying with your spouse, whether the next day you're going to go to confession for the first time in 10 years. Once you confess it, it's gone. It's gone. It no longer defines you. And we have to live with the concupiscence, but, but we can just start to get the ball rolling in the right direction. And the momentum from prayer and the sacraments, just keep it going. And, and it's never too late to start. Never. I don't yes. care if you've been married five years or 50 years. His mercies and, are new every day. And and God is an expert, the expert, on taking our messes and even our sin and turning it around. And, you know, we see the examples even in Scripture. I mean, we see we see David, King David. We see his sin. We see and and we see Saint, you know, we see Saul, who then becomes Paul through the conversion. And we see, you know, Saint Augustine. We see people who you know who lived in sin for you know or did really bad sins probably the some of us have not done so you know and and god 
can use us and and he can even you know i mean well like our paul's and my sin like sadly we also were living a life of contraception and and also even went as far as to paul to get a vasectomy and but you know it was when we heard again christopher west when we heard this beautiful uh the the beautiful vision that saint john paul laid out in theology of the body and it was that that drew us into the church because we were Lutheran. And and that is what drew us in. Even So it was in a sense, it was our sin. As Father Tedosi said, oh, happy fault. I mean, it, it right. is true. It's like, you know, Adam and Eve, it was like, it was their their fault that, that brought about so great a redeemer. We need Jesus. It's a good thing to need Jesus. And all things, all things work together for good. They for do. They all do. So, do. so, and I we mean, gain wisdom. We, we gain wisdom from recognizing where we have fallen short. Yes. And falling on our knees and asking God to redeem it, to transform it. Yes. And, and, and again, when, when you brought up our blessed mother, um, you know, sometimes we might just say, oh, my child seems so lost or whatever, but she is the mom. She is the greatest mom. I know when our daughter was far away on the other side of the Pacific and she was, she was struggling a bit and, and to, to just say, you know what, I don't know what to do, but you're, you are the best mom. You are her mom. Take care of things. Right? So we, we turn our children over to her and i mean and obviously we do as much as we can and we pray 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 um and but god loves them way 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 more than we ever could right and so his love and our blessed mother's love we can we can lean on that we can lean on that and know that 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 she hears our prayers and she passes them on to her son and he can't say no to her so you know there's there's a lot of hope so yeah yeah but we are now at at the close i i wish we weren't because um it's it's delightful patty to, it's just so delightful to be with you even though it's virtual i wish i could come and hug you but um but it's a delight yeah there we go <laughs> and um and each one of you each you know each one of you and your marriages we we will be praying for you like i said we we feel called paul and i feel called to kind of continue on in a, in a weekly kind of forum. We'll see how it goes. I mean, right now that's, it seems like that's what's, what God is calling us to do. And we'll see how that goes. But it's been a joy. It's been a real joy to be doing this summit. <clears throat> like I mentioned earlier, uh, we've made, we've made, I think almost every mistake that we could make, but I would know there's probably lots more coming. Um, but, but that's sometimes the way we learn best. And um, yeah. And it, so as we go forward, I know God will be with each one of you. He will be with us. And uh, if you want to continue to, you know, hear some good speakers and Paul and I will unpack a few things here and there. And we want to, we just want to encourage marriage. We, that's the thing. We just need, we need strong marriages and families. And in a culture now, which is not not at all affirming of strong marriages and families it's you know it's kind of crazy out there um but god this is this is our pathway this is our pathway to grow in holiness through our marriages and passing on the kingdom as we pass on our faith to our children so it's um yeah it's a privilege mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. oh there's something in chat here just a minute Let's see what we've got here um, oh, and Maureen said, thanks, great answer. And I think there, yeah, there was a lot in there. So um, it says, if I have a friend and her husband who is not Catholic, can I still invite them to the future meetings? Absolutely. Yes. And um, yes, it's for anyone and, uh, and everyone. It's, um, you know, sometimes I know when I was, we actually had our kids in Catholic schools while we were still Lutheran. And I can remember saying to them, to them, um, Oh, well, you, you can pray with them and stuff, but don't pray the Hail Mary. <laughs> and now it's kind of like, oh, my goodness. It's like, that's the best. But um, it, so, you know, there will be certain people who, you know, like who, who might kind of say, oh, well, you know, they won't understand certain things. But this is definitely this is Christ centered marriages. That's what we're aiming for. And, we're, and, and even if, if they're not Christians, invite them. This is the fullness of We've seen it in, in Patty's face, the joy, um, you know, in her marriage. This is, this is the way marriage is supposed to be and, and family life is supposed to be. 
And yes, we fall short sometimes, but God is good. And we just kind of keep on, keep on moving. I was wondering, Patty, if you would like to pray for us as we kind of wrap things I up. I was here. hoping we were going to close good. in prayer. And I didn't know awesome. if you were going to do that or you wanted well, to Well, I was do thinking that. about it, but I thought, I thought I'd invite you to pray for us. Okay, absolutely. Okay. Let's all okay. pray in thanksgiving. In the name of the Father, mm -hmm. and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Good and gracious God, thank you so much for the gift of marriage. Thank you for this call to love as you love us. And thank you for stamping this call in our very bodies, made as male and female, made in your image, to image your love in the Trinity. I ask your special blessing on all married couples throughout the world. May we have this vision. May we open our hearts to receive the love of you, our bridegroom. May we be true witnesses in the world that love matters, that marriage matters, that your marriage, uh, that marriage is a sacrament and help us to all be living witnesses to our families and to each other and to the church. Pray for any marriages, any couples right now who are struggling in their marriage. May you Lord just pour out your abundant graces for each and every couple who, who is struggling. Pour out your abundant graces on couples who are carrying a heavy cross right now. Pour out your abundant graces on couples who have been married for many, many years and might be facing sickness or illness, whatever it may be. And we ask you to bless all our families, our children, all our relatives and friends. May our marriages touch them. And may we be your light in this world. And right now, let us just give you all the glory as we say, all glory be to the Father and to the Son Father and, to the, and to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit as, as it was, it was in, the in the beginning, is now, now and, and ever shall be, shall be world, world without, without end. end. Amen. 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 Father, amen. Amen. Spirit, amen. Uh, amen. Good night. Good night. And thank, thank you so you. much. It was, was just beautiful. Oh, thank you so thank, much. God so bless much. you. To, to you too. All. Okay. And thank you everyone. And God bless. And yeah. we'll be sending an email along to a little follow up. So thanks again, Patty. Right. Awesome. Good night. Okay. My pleasure. Right. Bye. Good bye. Night. God bless. Bye bye. bye, -bye.